Timothy Peacock is going to be talking to us about some of the research she's been doing at Shape Security around automation and disruption in stolen payment card markets. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to get a preview of this this summer at Weiss, the Workshop for Economics and Information Security, which is another um, group of quant nerd type folks who study some of the risks that we're seeing in information systems. And so without further ado, let's welcome Tim. Do you have the clicker? Yeah, you need the clicker. That'll be helpful. I didn't know how to make that the sort of slide on the Oh, website. where's so if you can make it easy mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Tim. I work at a company in Mountain View called Shape Security. Uh, we protect websites against automated attacks. So what I'm going to be talking about is automated use of websites. Uh, this research, uh, some of us got to see earlier this summer. So I'm sorry for the people that are seeing you again, Russ. Happy to see you. Wonderful. Uh, I also did it with Alan Friedman, who is now with George Washington, but he's not here today, so I didn't put him on the slide. Uh, what we're going to be talking about are attacks in the payment card space and a possible way for the people in the payment card space to disrupt these attacks. Now, the payment card space is one of the biggest cyber risks and breaches. We have all seen, oh, my slides are out of order. Uh, all these breaches happened in the past couple of years. Uh, we've been seeing the news lately about Home Depot, the largest breach we've had yet, 40 million cards taken. Uh, so this is, a, this is a big area that's happening right now. There's a lot of risk related to this. How much is a stolen card worth to the criminals? How much does it cost the organization that loses the card? How much does it cost the issuing bank, the acquiring bank, the payment processor, the card network? How much does it cost consumers? There's a lot of people facing risk from this, so I think it's an interesting area for people here today. So uh, real quick for the people who are not super familiar with the payment card space, let me show you a basic model of the payment card space. If you are familiar with the payment card space, you'll see that there are some parties that are missing from this model. I alighted them for simplicity and ease of understanding. You basically have a five-party model. At the top is your card network. They are Visa, MasterCard, Amex. They essentially function as an IT shop providing plumbing between the different players below them. They establish branding for their cards, establish standards. They cooperate through the PCI model. Acquiring banks are also basically IT shops. They process payments for merchants. They take a fraction of the payment card fee on each transaction. Uh, they succeed by working at scale. Uh, their exposure to risk here is fairly limited. It mostly exposed in the case that the merchant ends up with too many debts that they can't pay back and defaults on their uh, chargebacks or refunds. You have merchants. Their incentive is to accept as many transactions as possible and be exposed to as little fraud as possible. They rely on the people upstream from them, the acquiring, their acquiring bank or their payment processor in some cases, or the card network to filter fraud, and they can do some fraud detection on their own, and they can contract with third-party fraud providers. People like Silvertail will do this. Uh, other new players like SIF Science are working on this space as well. Uh, the card holder, his or her incentives are pretty straightforward. They want to pay for things easily and not have somebody steal their card. Uh, and then the issuing banks have a really interesting position here because they are in some cases liable for fraudulent transactions, and in other cases, the merchant ends up liable for the cost of fraudulent transactions. And you have a split along card present and card not present transactions. The difference there is really simple. A card present transaction is one where the person is there with the card in person, and they sign the sheet of paper, and the merchant collects the signature. Card not present transactions, it's over the internet, over the phone, through the mail. It's anywhere that the merchant, when they're processing payment, and later discussing the payment in the event of fraud, doesn't have a signature on paper related to it. We're going to be mostly talking about card not present transactions today. The reason for this is that that's a growing share of the fraction. And once we get chip and pin here in the United States, it'll be a much larger portion of the fraud because chip and pin cards we've seen are hard to counterfeit. So what does the harms chain look like in credit card breaches? You have basically a straight line from breach. These are hard to detect. These are really hard to detect. Target had top of the line equipment from FireEye. They got alerts on their FireEye and weren't able to do anything about it. Home Depot, although one of their managers said, we're a shop that sells hammers, they also weren't able to detect it. 
lots of people are having a hard time stopping breaches. And they're highly skilled teams. They're small, they're hard to detect, um, and you don't have a lot of pain from it until the breach is discovered. So it's not like a growing pain, it's no pain and then a lot of it all of a sudden. So it's a hard thing to stop there. Um, the list of people breached is too long to go through. Uh, there are other sources of stolen credit cards. You have uh, more run-in-the-mill stuff like a server who swipes a card or an ATM with a skimmer installed. They're a much smaller fraction, but they're still out there. You also have man-in-the-browser attacks on consumers whose you know, computers, their endpoints are infected, and their data gets caught that way. Again, much smaller as an overall fraction than the major breaches. The wholesale step in the card value extraction chain are also hard for defenders, the good guys, us, to deal with because it's one-to-one -one relationships between one group of criminals and another group of criminals. These are trusted people who've worked together before. They're not a place where we have a lot of visibility. Uh, below that, you have the retail level and the card shops. These are things that we do have visibility on, and they're really fun. This is where uh, the lowest levels of criminals go up one level to buy the stolen cards. And it's actually a very consumerized experience. Uh, this is where you have people making advertisements about how good their cards are. This is where you have uh, stuff like the work that Brian Krebs has been doing documenting this. Uh, what you see here is a screenshot of a forum post by one of the operators of a card shop bragging about his latest batch of goods. Uh, it's almost like the heroin dealer who has different stamps on his baggies. These guys have different names for the batches of cards they're selling. And what they do is they brag about how often the cards work. And I was really curious about this. How does this guy know what fraction of his cards are good? Surely he can't call up Visa and say, hey, all of those cards that were used over this time period, they're still good, right guys? So how are they, how are they learning this? How are they performing this quality control step? And can we do anything about that? The market here is not one that has a lot of trust. Criminals don't have recourse to courts when they get scammed. Criminals don't have a way of inspecting cards before they buy them. It's a lot like a market for lemons, which the economists in the room will remember as a market where buyers don't have an ability to inspect the quality of goods before purchase. So buying a used car, you don't have a way of telling when buying that used car whether or not it's good. You're trusting the reputation of the dealer that you're buying it from, and you're trusting that our legal system gives you some recourse. It's worse for the criminals. They don't have a legal system. So all they're going on is reputation. And so the sellers have this big signaling effect where they want to talk about what their quality is, and they're very dedicated to maintaining the quality of their uh, goods, as it were. So how are they perform? Oh, more screenshots of card shops. This is fun. So this is, right now, you can go to this website if you want. I don't recommend it. Uh, and they'd probably be mad if we did it from their IP address, so don't, don't do, do that. Do not do it here. Violation of policy. Thank you. Fire up Tor and then do it, I guess. I don't know. That's, that's what I did. Um, but they're, they're advertising. This is, this is a site aimed at consumers. They have consumerized discounts. They tell you how well it's working. They even tell you that you can do it on Saturday if you use this particular method. They want you to buy the cards. They're really friendly about it. Um, but, but don't go do it. You'll get in trouble, I think. Uh, but again, they're, they're talking about their valid rate. They're saying what fraction of their cards are good. And they're saying a fairly specific number. Now, I don't know if they're using the Thomas scoring system here to get good numbers or not, but they have numbers. <laughs> uh, but they have numbers, and they're proud of their numbers. They really believe what they're saying, and they're, they know that their reputation, their continued sales rely on it. Now, you might think, well, what, what's reputation really worth in the criminal world? Um, cards on this website go for about $20 a pop. Cards on other forums, that are less reputable go for about 30 cents a pop. So there's a huge difference in the amount of value you get for a retail level card uh, based on your reputation. They have quality policies, replacement po policies, in two languages that talk about the valid rate. They're, they're really serious about this quality stuff and their replacement, their replacement policy for cards that aren't working. So in order to like, be making money at this, they must have a sense that they're right when making these claims. I got to wondering, how do they know? How do they possibly know what's going on with their cards? Uh, they engage in a step that I call refining. So this is a picture of an oil refinery, fractional distillation. Uh, you probably remember this from Intro to Chemistry. 
Uh, they do it a little bit differently. They have a pool of stolen cards that they've got that they want to sell next week. They've got an army of bots that they can fire up and point at websites. And they can make small value, large volume transactions on websites that process lots of small value, small value, large volume transactions. Sites like Netflix, which processes 20,000 user signups a day. 20,000 new users a day put in their credit card to Netflix. If the criminals add another 5,000 to that all around the world on a rented botnet, that's noise. So they can bubble out the good cards that they're going to sell and drop the cards that have, for whatever reason, already been canceled. Consumers canceled the card. Bank already detected some of this fraud happening. They're able to separate the wheat from the chaff here. And in theory, they could even go a step further and do some sampling and be pretty clever about it. I've talked to some people about different ways you might uh, make even fewer transactions. But it seems they want to do this and have a good sense of what's going on. This is easy because there are 50 million or 500 million compromised endpoints out there. You can rent a 10,000 node botnet for $2 an hour. You could use AWS to do this kind of work. It's not hard to get infected endpoints to do your bidding. And these are people's computers. These are not like bad servers sitting somewhere. This is grandma's computer in Iowa that's infected. It's otherwise a reputable endpoint. So they're not going to get caught doing this, we think. Why not? <laughs> yeah, and you can buy it with one of your cards. Can you repeat the question? Uh, so what does existing anti-fraud look like? You guys know, I'm sure some of you are in this space and know a lot more about this than I do. But fundamentally, what we're doing is we're waiting until fraud happens. We're waiting until we find indicators of it. We're waiting until we see some hoof prints that the horse has left the barn. And then we turn around over our shoulders and say, OK, common point of purchase analysis, which other horses were in those barns and which other horses do we think are missing? Let's go check those stalls or shut off those cards and send the users new horses. And this, this works, but it's not super for users to have to get a new horse every couple of months. You have to go update all of your recurring payments. You have to change your saddle. It's really inconvenient. Uh, you know, there's some real-time anti-fraud, and it's getting better. But there's not proactive solutions against this marketplace that exists. So what I want to talk about are stopping automated payment card use. The criminals rely on automated payment card use to do their refining step. Refining and quality control is a critical link in the criminal's ability to make money at this. Criminals do this because they make money at it. If we can interrupt their ability to make money at it, take their value per card from $20 to 30 cents, their incentive to steal the cards, to sell the cards, goes way down. And we may have efficacy against this fairly expensive problem without having to rely on things like securing our servers better, which has turned out to be a really hard problem. So why can we stop automated transactions as a means to this end? Well, no legitimate user automates your e-commerce site. That's just not happening. Real people click the buttons, work through your flow the way they're meant to. Um, we also don't have to boil the ocean here. There are only so many people that sell software to build shopping carts. There are only so many people that make software to do transaction processing online. There's only so many people that, trans that do transactions at a volume that you know, the criminals can use. They can't do this on a store that processes five cards a day. That will blow everything up if they do that. So we're not, this is not a huge space that we need to uh, deal with. In the past, we've tried to deal with these markets by shutting them down. We've tried to identify the servers, arrest the guys responsible. That leads to what you call a balloon effect in political science. You put down cocaine production in Colombia, it shifts to Peru. You shut down Silk Road, you get she Sheep Road, Silk Road 2, Evolution Marketplace, and they come back nastier than they were before. So the past uh, anti-criminal efforts were not really that good. And it's really interesting, uh, in cases where criminals had had an, a uh, monopoly on a particular market, you shut them down, you end up disrupting a monopoly, which turns out to be good for the, consu the criminal consumers, because when you disrupt monopolies, you get better prices and better supply. So it may be that our past approaches to this were counterproductive. Uh, finally, this is a place that we control. We control what our websites look like for the most part. We don't always control what's running on our servers, but we have a pretty good way of testing what our servers are serving. We can just visit our own websites. This is a place where we have still fairly good visibility. So what's a good anti-automation solution look like? Uh, it should be free effective, and low friction. You can probably, of these three, choose two. 
Uh, what does effective mean? It means it stops people from using automated means to interact with the website. What does low friction mean? It means that it doesn't prevent legitimate users from using a website. And what does free mean? It means you don't pay money for it. Uh, there are some cases where this may be organizational specific. What parts of the organization control what gets posted to the website? Does the fraud team have a good ability to get software in there? Does the web team have a lot of control? Do the network guys get in the way? It depends. So when I presented this at Weiss, I made a clever joke about Fermat. But here I have enough time to talk about different anti-automation solutions. So that's fun. Uh, we've probably all seen CAPTCHAs. This is technology from the late 90s. These are the squiggly letters you type into a website. Uh, not a great user experience. The WC3 has called these uh, considered harmful because of their impact on visually impaired users. Not good. Uh, it turns out that this is meant to use a hard problem in computer vision. But as you drive it to be a hard problem in computer vision, you drive up the false positives on human beings. And as computers get better, it drives down the true negatives. So you can make them harder, but that leads to the human rate getting worse, which means that your signal to noise ratio gets worse. So this kind of technology has an absolute limit on how useful it can be because it's hurt from both sides. There are also commercialized solution services to this. You can visit a lot of websites that will offer to solve captures for you at pennies per thousand. You have a room full of low paid workers who sit there all day solving CAPTCHAs. It's not that hard with globalization. Um, there are good free solutions to this. Um, Google's reCAPTCHA project is very well known. You can solve book visual recognition problems. You can feed their learning corpus. But this example is from their website. I can't read that. And maybe it's because it's on the projector. It's a little easier on the TV screen in front of me. But it's hard to read these things. They're not very good. You could go with JavaScript proof of work functions. People really think these are fun right now because of Bitcoin. Uh, this is based on finding hash collisions, lots of detail there. There's some effectiveness. You slow down the bad guys. You could set the parameters on your proof of work problem to be however long it, you think it'll take a real human to work through your checkout flow, which depending on how much stuff you have on that page, could be 30 or 60 seconds. That slows the botnet down from being able to do 10 of these in a second to 10 of these in 10 minutes. That's not bad. But you still have the problem of 500 million infected endpoints. Uh, they're free, which is nice. There are lots of solutions out there you can download. Implementations, good to go off the shelf. So organizationally, this can be pretty easy to implement. Uh, JavaScript proof of work might be a great way to do it. But it might not be. Uh, you might have an IPS system in place. Uh, when I was in school, we had a spring weekend. And you had to buy tickets for it. And they didn't have enough seating in the indoor space, the rain location. So the morning the tickets went on sale, the entire campus would try to buy tickets. And what this looked like to our ticket vendor, the school required the people who ran the concert to use the one vendor, was 5,000 people connecting from the same IP address because we were all natted out the same connection. And they thought every year, every year this happened. They knew this would happen. And every year, their IPS blew it up. And so every year, they would have to run the ticket sale twice. And this led to such consternation in the CS department that the kids uh, ended up attacking the website and making the website pay them for tickets by setting the ticket price to be negative. <laughs> so your IPS may be effective in some cases, but you have a big risk of false positives. Um, they're also not free, so that's not, not rad. Um, but it's a start. It's not so effective, though, against a distributed attacker because he can just throw more IPs at it and slow roll you. So there are some limitations to that kind of technology. Um, Real-time polymorphism, different approach, more effectiveness, um, harder to implement. You don't know if it will blow up your site. You don't know what's going on there. Um, in theory, no friction for legitimate users, but it's also in the category of not free. So you have organizational trade-offs. If you have a network team that is very strict about what you put in the network, different things might be differently OK. So it really depends on what you're trying to achieve and how you can achieve it and what kind of budgetary goals you have, what kind of anti-automation you implement. There's no uh, right answer here. Um, at an ecosystem view, uh, for the economists in the room, there's a really interesting thing happening. There are two kinds of websites that are affected by credit card fraud online. There are kind that are used for refining and the kind that are used for cash out. And they're very different. The kind that are used for refining 
have a high volume of transactions. Um, it was in the news just a couple days ago that Verizon's Redbox Instant stopped accepting new users back in June and is being shut down now. One of the reasons it was shut down in June was because the website was being used to test cards because it was a very low sign-up cost. The criminals didn't run out their budget on the card, and there were apparently enough people signing up for Redbox that they could hide in the noise, but not enough that Redbox Instant didn't notice this and shut off new re user reg. Uh, on the other side are cash-out merchants. These are people that sell resellable goods. They might be a site that sells gift cards, a site where you can cash out somehow. I'm not a criminal, I don't want to give you guys ideas. Um, the refining merchants, really, they don't have that big of an impact from this fraud. They don't feel the pain the same way that the people who are truly affected by fraud do. They might pay a chargeback on each of those fraudulent transactions, but if they're using payments processor, it gets fuzzy on how much they end up paying from this, but they're enabling the downstream harms of the stolen credit cards later because they're supporting the marketplaces and the ecosystem that makes credit card fraud possible. The cash out merchants, on the other hand, don't have any visibility upstream of where that card was used before. Only the issuing bank, the acquiring bank, maybe the acquiring bank, only the issuing bank and the network see where the card was used before. So the cash out merchants can't see where the harms are coming from, and the refining merchants can't see where the harms are going. So they don't, they don't have a way of cooperating on this. But what if we did have a way of cooperating on it? What if there are three different ways we could cooperate on it? What if we could have a regulatory mode of cooperating on it, where we agree that this is a problem, and that we should have some regulation around this, and you know, we could say people have to implement anti-automation if they have this volume of bad transactions a year. This seems unlikely to me. It seems unlikely to attract the attention of regulators because it's not hurting consumers, and it doesn't seem to be a big enough of a problem. Maybe there's a liability approach to all this. Maybe the cash out merchants could get together and say, ooh, we're being hurt by this, and sue the merchants that are allowing the refining. I'm not sure there's a good tort there for that, especially given the way that liability works in computer software. You can't sue Microsoft for making buggy software. Uh, you can't, it's a hard area to get into. Uh, but maybe there's some information sharing. Maybe there's some cross-subsidy approach we could get at here, where the different players in the ecosystem work together. The network's figured out how to work together through the PCI model. They've had good luck cooperating there. Maybe we could sit down the people affected by this on both sides, the acquiring banks, the issuing banks, get everybody in a room and have uh, peace and joy and uh, angels sing. I, I don't know. Uh, but you can imagine a world where an anti-automation solution uh, passively sits there, detects automation, and then sells that information back to the issuing banks as a strong signal of fraud. You can imagine that this happens all over the place as a risk signal. I don't know how to get there, but there would be some interesting data if you did. Uh, in the future, what does this mean? Uh, chip and pin is coming eventually. It's going to shift fraud online. Uh, this is a graph I've shamelessly stolen from a Ross Anderson paper, looking at what happened when chip and pin was deployed in the UK. Uh, basically, card not present fraud takes off, and the other kinds of payment card fraud die down. If you're wondering why uh, counterfeit fraud goes back up after chip and pin, which it's meant to prevent, it's because they figured you could still get the Magstripe data off of the UK cards and then sell it to people in the United States who could print it onto Magstripes and process the cards that way here. Because chip and pin has that backup option, it was still possible to commit that fraud. But that's UK specific and we probably won't see that here. We'll just see this set of things. So card not present fraud is where it's going to be at in the future. Um, the fees from processing Payment cards in this country? Does anybody know what the fees amount to? The fees alone. How much are the fees? How much? Billions. Millions? Billions. How many billions? billions? 30. It's 30 billions of fees in this country, which is among the top 100 of nation state GDPs. So there's a lot, a lot to happen here uh, of things for people to fight over. So it's going to be a huge lobby fight coming on where liability gets shifted, where risk gets shifted uh, with chip and pin adoption. Are merchants still going to be liable? Are online people still going to be liable? How will the rollout of 3D Secure, uh, EMVs, standard for online transactions affect things? I don't know. But we do know that when there's this much money involved, people are going to be nasty about it. Um, but it's a, it's a small intervention to add 
I have a question. On the previous um, slide, you had an indication of how chip and pin addresses um, the risk, or the fraud, excuse me. I should know better. We don't say risk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that the chart only goes to 2008. Have yeah. there been any studies on how effective chip and pin is with the recent breaches we've seen? That's a good question. Uh, the recent breaches are probably too recent for there to have been good studies done so far, and I haven't seen any yet. I grabbed this graph because I remembered it from a paper I read of Ross's when I was an undergrad that I liked. Uh, but I'm sure that will be a really interesting area to see. The likely result is that it shifts online where you don't have the chip and pin type security, and you can still use the numbers off the front of the card like you do right now. That's the likely outcome. Uh, but it's possible that this is a small intervention, adding some kind of anti-automation to websites that could make an impact on the marketplace in a way that we haven't been able to disrupt it before. It's something that, as we see here, only seems to get bigger. So it's possible that we have a new avenue with new technologies and anti-automation to finally disrupt this kind of marketplace. Uh, the retailers are already taking out ads in the DC airports and subways. People are gearing up for this fight, and uh, it's coming. So the winter uh, of lobbying fights is coming. Other Guess. questions? Patrick, hang on. Well. A couple of things. Yeah. Um, just a bit of information. Uh, you and I were at Weiss this summer, and the fellow from the Federal Reserve who gave the talk at lunch Richard corroborated Sullivan. some numbers that I had heard that the cost of payment card fraud as a percentage of payment transaction value mm -hmm. represent, represents about five cents per $100. So I don't know about you guys, but if somebody offered me a deal that I could keep $99.95 and pay a nickel to somebody, I'd probably take that. Um, in the United States, it was actually 10 cents. So, um, and then, then the comment or question for you. Please. I've been, it's been explained to me that with chip and pen in Europe, if there is a question of fraud on a card present mm -hmm. transaction, that the onus is on the card holder mm -hmm. to prove to the bank that that's a fraudulent charge. Which is very hard to do. Yeah. So Especially how is that going to play with our legislation in this country that you're held harmless for fi everything over 50 bucks, but effectively, you know, free? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know how the Treasury is going to handle that between Regulation Z and Z, but okay. uh, likely it will look a little different than it does over there. Um, amplifying that problem with the banks is that they don't keep the data around long enough to show the details of how the attacks are happening, and Ross, again, uh, has been doing really good work on pushing the banks to do better there. So we'll, we'll see what he manages to achieve over there and how that looks over here. I don't think we'll see as bad a situation for consumers on this side of the Atlantic. Coming, 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 coming. Oh my god, yes. You got to repeat that, wait, wait. She asked if I wanted to know answers, to which I said yes. I would be happy to share some information. So uh, yes, the numbers that you heard were right. Uh, fraud system-wide is probably around 10 basis points right now. That's uh, 10 cents on every $100, how you described it. Um, <clears throat> the regulations around who is liable in a fraud transaction are defined by the payment card brands. Um, and uh, they sort of facilitate dealing with disputes. Mm -hmm. So in the current world, in the US, in the card present world, actually, I think it's pretty much true everywhere, uh, in card present, the issuer is responsible for counterfeit fraud. And the merchant is liable only if they did not collect the signature for the transaction, which is why fraud in card not present is much higher, because of course, you can't collect their signature when they are online. Uh, so that is why, uh, and, and that is why a lot of merchants invest in 
um, anti-fraud technology be in the online space because they are liable. So what is happening next year actually is the entity that will, who it's between right now in discussions is the merchant and the issuer who is going to bear liability for fraud transactions when chip and pin rolls out because it's a, it's a liability shift. In order to encourage merchants to adopt the chip and pin technology, um, they are going, they, it is actually them who will be liable if they could have used a chip and pin, if the mm. card has chip and pin on it and they don't process it. So it's encouraging them to get up to chip and pin so that they will not, they will not be liable for fraud on a chip and pin, or sorry, on a chip card, and an EMV chip card transaction. So and in the US, most issuers are looking to implement chip and SIG. So you'll have the chip based, what is it called? Like a, it's not a swipe anymore, it's a, a dip. dip. You'll have a dip instead of a swipe, but you'll still sign for it as opposed to PIN. Now, um, what, what Ross Anderson is concerned about is in the UK, um, where the, according to the card networks, it's between um, issuers and uh, merchants who is liable for a transaction. Actually, technically, it's the merchant acquirer, but the acquirer just passes that on to the merchant, of course, because it's their point of sale um, practices that dictate whether or not they are liable. So between the merchants and the issuers. However, um, in the US, we have Reg E and Reg Z, which say consumers are not held liable for unauth. That isn't exactly true. In, a lot, in other places, they don't necessarily have the same consumer protections we have in the US. Reg e and, e and Z will still exist, but the problem is not whether the regulations are correct or who will be officially liable in cases where the issuer is responsible for counterfeit, as they are now. But as you say, banks don't have as much practice. So for a long time with debit card transactions, which were PIN-based, when there would be fraud on those transactions, it would take the issuers a lot longer to give the money back or figure out if they were if they actually felt it was a true claim because the idea was the pin was so secret and so secure if someone had your pin it must be because you had given it up but when debit cards a lot of the debit cards in the US are actually branded Mastercard or Visa and under the Mastercard Visa um, brand you consumers have zero liability they market on it so so Ross Anderson's fear in the UK that consumers are going to start to be held liable for chip and pin-based transactions because the pin is such a secret and so secure, his, his, a lot of his concern has to do with the fact that um, threats have been identified. Oh, my God. <laughs> Anyway, you know what? If anyone is super interested in this, um, uh, I can. Uh, if you ask me a few more questions, I can do a lightning talk on it. But I actually think that might be a good segue into a different question. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. They're they're gonna get thank me. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna address that threat identified. The train is about to hit me. I'm gonna die. Glad it's a threat. We're, I'm glad we're using your machine. <laughs> Hi. So. Target was PCI compliant yeah, they when were. all of this went down. So what sort of changes do you see coming from the PCI requirements as a result of, result of all of these compromises? Oh, God, I have no idea. Uh, I mean, I think we might see that we have a little less faith in what that means, but I have no idea what changes are going to come to that. Uh, it's, that's way different than the stuff I'm focusing on. Yeah, I would guess none. And none that are effective. None that make a meaningful difference. The bad guys have gotten really good at compromising systems and moving inside systems. The target attack was super sophisticated and took months to carry out. I mean, they're good at what they do. That's why I'm not proposing better antivirus. Uh, hold on, please. No, I mean, for years you've heard about dynamic card numbers, and there's, you know, every few months there's another Kickstarter with someone who has a credit card that generates new numbers. I mean, is that really going to be sort of the, the golden goose to solve all this? I mean, single-use numbers or? Um... Uh, in places where they've tried to roll out transaction authentication numbers, it's been somewhat successful. Uh, the security of those systems is hard to get right. 
So imagine you're a banking customer, and when you log in, you have two-factor, and it texts your phone. That just means that the malware they put on your endpoint has to also make a jump to your phone and capture the messages there. So I mean, it's, it's in, it makes it harder, but I don't know if it's perfect. It, it's not perfect. It makes it harder. So yeah, I was just talking to Michael here. We were we we're trying to measure how long it would take for someone to ask you an Apple Pay question. So oh. since nobody did, let's ask an Apple Pay question. Okay. So uh, do you think that, uh, given what you have been seeing, do you think that, from what you've read, of course, uh, it would be a substantive, substantive improvement or not? Mm. What fraction of people use iPhones? What fraction of people use the most recent iPhones that support Apple Pay? It will improve it that much, at most. So 10% improvement at most? Yeah, that's a good answer, I think. Yeah. The only people protected by Apple Pay are the ones using it, right? I deserved it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't, I didn't think I was being mean. I, I was trying to work out your question. That was, that was actually the best, question, the best answer that someone could do days out of this, so yeah. Sorry. It was. I mean, it's not that you gave a mean answer. Just that I had a stupid question. That's, oh no, there are no stupid questions. <laughs> Please, there are only on. stupid question askers. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was mean. I'm going to follow up with another stupid Apple Pay question. Oh boy. Possibly, as a non-cryptographer, um, I have read a lot of the specs on what they're doing. And it strikes me, and I voted with my pocketbook, although Apple Pay is not up and running yet, I don't think. So it's protecting 0%. Yeah, right. Um, it strikes me as a pretty elegant, secure solution. You know, they've bas basically got an HSM built into the phone. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm kind of looking forward to it. I will use it. I don't care about the people who don't have iPhone 6s. They're not my problem. So uh, <laughs> He cares about 5% of the world. Well, no, but I mean, um, mobile payments in general, mm -hmm. forget about whether it's Apple or whoever it is, is, is a wave that's surely coming uh, to this country. And I see a lot of benefits, but I, you know, we don't know what the harms are yet. So, it's an exciting area to be sure. I've actually got a comment on the, uh, the earlier discussion about the chip pins. In Canada, we've had these things for five or six years now, and uh, what's uh, what we've gotten to now is with uh, any purchase up to hundred dollars on the chip pin, you just tap. You don't need any signature or anything. Uh, but people are finding that the readers are picking up the wrong credit card from someone's purse or wallet. Huh. So. Uh, Thanks to PackSafe, I now have an RFID wallet. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much.